Um, I'm super, super grateful that I'm talking with you today on this topic because I'll tell you right now that emotional intelligence is a game changer. It's a game changer for your personal life and also for your professional life. So everything that I teach you today and that we dive into is cross-curricular, okay? So that means you can use it in any single area. I will also tell you that 75% of professionals in the United States, okay, specifically 75% of professionals, they derail their career and their success because of a lack of emotional and social intelligence. It's a very, very high number, okay? So we're gonna talk about it today. We're gonna dive into it. There will be opportunity for you to ask me questions. And I hope you have your journal ready and your pencil and your pen because we're gonna be doing some activities and writing things down. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna share my screen with everyone. Um, and then I can still actually see you when I share my screen. So don't go anywhere because I feed off of your energy. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you guys can all see that, right? You just give me a little head nod. Okay, perfect. So. As Tadek told you guys, my name is Natalina Nasserdine. I'm gonna be your trainer for the day um, or for the evening. And we're just gonna jump straight in. So I wanna start just by saying, you know, what is emotional and social intelligence? Most people don't really know what that means. It's a big buzzword, right? That we see on social media and LinkedIn. Oh, you have to have EQ and EI, but what does that really mean? And how does that apply to your life? Right, and how does it apply to the lives of the individuals that you're coaching and mentoring and working with on a daily basis? So the definition of emotional intelligence is the capacity for recognizing our own feelings, okay, and feelings of others, for motivating ourselves and motivating and managing others, okay? And it was established by two men named Peter Salavoy and John Mayer, not the musician John Mayer, another John Mayer. <laughs> but it was actually made popular by a man named Daniel Goleman. So if you go type in emotional intelligence on Google or on the internet, Daniel Goleman is the first person that's gonna come out. So again, if we break it down, we define emotional intelligence as the ability to recognize, understand, and manage our emotions and ourselves. And then the second piece is recognize, understand, and influence the emotions of others. I will tell you now that every single challenge that we deal with with the workforce, we work with small, medium, and large companies and individuals, every challenge falls under emotional intelligence because there's actually another 18 competencies that branch under it, and that's what we really need to dive into today. Okay, so again, in a nutshell, these are the four pillars. So these are our four top pillars, right? Self-awareness, self-management, and then social awareness and relationship management. The first two pillars have to do with us. The second two pillars have to do with how we associate and behave and work with others. For, so first two are us internal and second two are how we work with others, right? In the workforce, how we coach, how we lead, how we communicate, empathy, diversity, inclusion, cultural understanding. Those are the last two pillars. So again, 75% of careers are derailed for reasons related to emotional competencies. So this is the inability to handle interpersonal problems, um, unsatisfactory team leadership during times of difficulty or conflict, the inability to adapt cha to change or to elicit trust, stress management, all of these challenges stem down to emotional intelligence. EI or EQ. So those are the abbreviations. You can use either. EI stands for emotional intelligence. EQ stands for emotional quotient, whichever one you prefer. Okay. So what does emotional intelligence do for us? It creates greater job success, healthier relationships, greater health, because as we know, 80% of health challenges are associated to stress and emotional intelligence tackles stress and emotional management, right? It also provides for the ability to have positive and rational decision-making, and lastly, to uncover blind spots for optimal potential, right? So have you ever had that moment where you think, oh man, I wish I could just have a little bit more in my personal, my professional life. I wish I can get to that next step 
but you don't know how. You don't know what's not working. You know something's off, but you can't identify it. That's what we call our blind spots. And emotional intelligence helps us find them and see them and then bridge the gap in our potential. Okay, so here's the big, here's the big 18 competencies that we're gonna dive into. So screenshot this, do whatever you want, write it down. I'm gonna sit on this slide for a little bit. So you have some time to write these all down. Okay, so as mentioned, there's 18 competencies under emotional intelligence. And again, every single challenge that you probably are dealing with as a professional or on a personal level is gonna fall under these 18 competencies. And so as I'm walking you through them, I want you to kind of check off, okay, like which one, which one is me or does that resonate with you? Really think about yourself. And then as we move down the two pillars, then you can think about how it's you working with others, right? How are you behaving around others? So the first pillar is self-awareness. That's that first pillar we talked about. This is all things self. So emotional awareness with yourself. So are you aware when you do feel an emotion? And not only when you feel an emotion, but what emotion do you feel? And where do you feel it? So what's the emotion you feel? Where do you feel it in your body? Okay, what, what can you identify it on as beyond the basic happy and anger, right? Like there's another 75 emotions that we can label and identify. And typically as individuals, we just stick to the basic six, right? So like anger, happy, sad, but we really want to be able to identify our deep emotion, right? So frustrated, abandoned, right? Getting to that deeper level of how we feel and where do you feel it? So I know for me, I feel my emotions in my upper right shoulder. Okay. When I'm about to cry, I feel it right in my throat. It swells up. And when I get really, really stressed out, which doesn't happen too much anymore because thanks to emotional intelligence, but I feel it in my stomach. Okay. So some of you might have similar feelings as well. The second competency is by far the most important. It's accurate self-assessment. So the way that you see yourself, do other people see you the same way? And this is where blind spots come in, right? Because we can see ourselves in a different way and people can see ourselves in the complete opposite way, right? So I'll give you an example. I used to be an executive as Tadek mentioned, I was 27 years old and I had 200 professionals under me at that age, okay? I kept hearing team members say, you're intimidating, you're intimidating as a leader, you're intimidating as a leader. And I kept saying 27 at the time, this was a decade ago, no, that's your problem, that's, I'm not intimidating, that's you, I've got nothing <laughs> to do with that. And then I decided to do an anonymous survey as a leader because I wanted to grow. And out of 200 professionals, 75% of them came back and said I was intimidating. Okay, what does that tell you? That tells you that the assessment of myself was completely inaccurate. So I knew that that was a blind spot that I needed to work on, okay? So I want you to think about yourself. Have, have you ever had a moment where somebody said to you, oh, you're stubborn, or you know, you're more confident than you think you are, and it was shocking to you? Like you heard something and you thought, I don't, that's not true. I'm not like that. And then maybe a week later, somebody said the same thing. And then over time, more and more people said it and you thought, maybe I, maybe I am this way, or maybe I do have this, but you just didn't know. So accurate self-assessment, incredibly, incredibly important. The third competency under self-awareness is my second favorite topic to talk about. I wrote an entire book on emotional intelligence and self confidence. 82% of professionals struggle with self-confidence. The ability to think that they're enough, not feeling that they're enough, self-doubt, the inability to self-promote, the inability to take risks because of fear or self-doubt or limiting beliefs that pop into their mind. And this is a really, really big challenge for professionals. And I've seen this globally. Okay. It's not a North American thing. It is by far around the world, professionals and companies that I've worked with, it's the same challenge that individuals around the world don't feel like they're enough, don't feel like they're contributing, 
don't feel like they can get to that next step or that they have what they need in order to be successful and to get to that next level of their potential. It's one of the greatest tragedies I've seen in human beings is a lack of self-confidence. And a lot of the challenges that we're dealing with as individuals comes from self-confidence. Because when we don't feel good about ourselves, what happens? We behave in certain ways that affect our relationships, our work relationships, our friendships, how we show up in the professional space. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, but I want you to know that out of the thousand professionals that we assessed, 82% of them, including Google executives, came back and said that they struggle with this competency. Okay, so that was only the first pillar, my friends. <laughs> we got through three out of 18. <laughs> so now you know how important this is and how can it affect our well being, our stress levels, how we show up, and how we interact with people. So now I'm going to go to the second pillar that still has to do with the self. And this is what we call self-management. And under self-management, this is where we have the six competencies. The first one is emotional self-control and stress management. How are we managing our emotions? How are we managing our behaviors and the way we think and feel? And that's not always easy, especially right now during COVID-19 and the racial injustice that we're seeing around the world that stemmed from America. Right, all of these different things that are happening, we need to be able to manage and control ourselves and our stress. The second one is transparency. And this is also what we call integrity. So when you go to bed at night, are you the same person that when you walk into the workspace? Are you the same person behind closed doors? Are you leading with honor? Are you leading with integrity? Or are your behaviors not in alignment with what you're saying? This is very, very important. The third is adaptability, okay? Again, we're seeing this a lot right now with COVID-19. Do you have the ability to adapt? I'm gonna tell you right now that this is a game, the adaptability is really, really pivotal for the future because in five years from now, when artificial intelligence starts to take hold, half of the competencies and the techniques that we've built are gonna be mundane. And the only way we're gonna be able to keep that competitive edge is through being able to adapt, adapt our learning, adapt our competencies, adapt our technique. And so if you remember anything from today along with self-confidence is the ability to adapt, also known as a growth mindset, okay? Number four is achievement. This is that achievement and the sense of standards that you have for yourself. Are you constantly playing small? Are you just doing the average? Oh, you know, that's good enough. Do you have the good enough mentality? Or do you really push yourself be just because? Not because of any incentive, but simply because you want to have a high standard of excellence for you. The fifth one is intrinsic motivation. Also something that we find to be very, very difficult during this time of COVID-19. Because intrinsic motivation means that you are internally driven and motivated with no external incentive. Meaning, no money, no paycheck, no workspace, no friends, no colleagues drive your motivation to be better. You wake up in the morning and you put your best foot forward just because. No other reason, just because, right? And so this is another challenge that we're seeing with some of our leaders is that they're having a hard time motivating their team as they're working remotely because so many people are interpersonal learners meaning that they're collaborative learners that they like to walk into a space and they like to be with co-workers and sit in a space and, and that's how they function and now they're having to rewrite what that looks like so motivation being internal means that you can sit in a room by yourself get work done feel accomplished and that is really what we're needing in this current moment and then the last competency is optimism. So being able to look at any situation or experience and not ignore the challenges. Okay, we don't want, we don't want false positivity and false optimism, which is what we can do sometimes, but it's being able to really look at a situation, acknowledge the challenges, but still see a solution and still be able to say, okay, there's gonna be some challenges here. It's not gonna be easy but we can solve the problem. We can move past this and let's figure it out, okay? 
So those right there are the first nine competencies under the first two pillars. Now you can see that if we don't have these first nine competencies, if we can't manage our emotions, if we can't control our stress, if we don't have confidence within ourselves, if we're not internally motivated, how are we going to coach and lead others, right? We wouldn't be able to, to, to our best and, and best capability. The difference between self-awareness and self-management that I always like to say is self-awareness is knowing you know that the ice cream is bad for you, right? You know that when you eat the ice cream, it's going to hurt your stomach. And self-management is, I'm going to eat it anyway because I like ice cream. So I'm going to eat it and then I'm going to deal with the consequence later, right? What we really want to do here with emotional intelligence, and this is the self-management part, is we want to we wanna create elasticity in what we call our EQ rubber band, okay? So imagine, I'm going to stop sharing here for a second so that you can see this visual. Imagine that you have this rubber band, okay? When we have short EQ in the first two pillars, so self-awareness and um, self-management, our rubber band is this big, okay? And so what happens is that if an experience happens, okay, the space between the experience and our emotion is short, meaning that we're going to have an emotional reaction. Okay, and that's how much space is in between. It's short. What we want to do is extend the rubber band as much as we can through building EQ like we are today. So now the space between the experience and the emotion is larger. So now we have time to lo drop logic in the middle. And that's what we need to do. When we rest, when we're under overconsumption with media and all these things that are happening, it creates a short rubber band. And that's why people feel stressed and they respond quicker. And then our reaction mode is a lot faster than we want it to be. The more we can cultivate stretching the rubber band, the more groundedness we have, the more space we have to again, drop the logic in the middle and prevent us from doing anything that could potentially hurt someone, hurt ourselves, get us in trouble, say something that we're gonna have to regret and take back. And that's really what we wanna do with emotional and social intelligence. It's not about getting rid of every single feeling. It's not about getting rid of self-doubt. It's not about ever having stress. It's about stretching the band so that we have time to process it and then respond appropriately. And that is really, that's the, the key factor here that we need to know, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and continue to share my screen and we're gonna keep diving in. So the third pillar is social awareness. Now we're getting into others, okay? First, so important competency is empathy. Okay, so empathy, you know, you've heard a lot about it. Brene Brown is an expert in empathy and vulnerability, if anyone's familiar with her. It's being able to just put yourself in other people's shoes, right? Now, this is super easy when you're not involved in the conversation, right? When someone comes to you and they just need someone to talk to, it's easy to be empathetic. It's more difficult to be empathetic when someone comes to talk to you about you, <laughs> right? That's where some of the ego comes in and, and that's where we want to bring in that emotional intelligence where we could still practice empathy in here openly even when we're involved in it, okay? And we'll, we'll address that a little bit later. The next one is organizational awareness. Very, very important for the industry and the field that you're in as well. Being able to walk into a room to walk into an organization, to walk on any site and understand the energy, understand the organizational dynamics without even opening your mouth, simply by just feeling what's happening, understanding who the key stakeholders are, the decision makers. You know, you notice that before I came on, I had my video off. That was very strategic. It wasn't because I didn't want you to see me. It's because I was practicing organizational awareness. I wanted to know what was the energy of the participants. Who's in the room? Is anyone talking? What are they doing? Are all the videos off or half? I was trying to gauge what my environment was so that I can show up accordingly, okay? Every time I do public speaking, I'll go into the room an hour ahead of time and I'll sit in the back of the room. Some people don't even know that I'm the speaker. And I'm just watching the room. I'll see how people talk to one another who's the person that's running around, they're probably the decision maker or someone that's involved in the conference. And like, these are the kind of things that I'm looking for because 
that'll determine what your energy should be, right? That's going to determine how do I show up for this individual or how do I coach or mentor or guide this organization? And then the last one is service oriented, which I'm sure all of you can agree with. It's showing up with service, right? It's understanding how can I best serve this individual or this organization and coming from a service mindset. That's the third pillar, social awareness. And then the last pillar, relationship management, by far the most, one of the most important is leadership. All things leadership come into here. Okay, so we, we're talking about leadership, coaching, relatability, so your ability to relate with individuals, your ability to influence individuals, we hope in a positive way, okay? The ability to manage conflict and teamwork. Now, transparently speaking, right, and I think we can all agree, we can't lead, coach, right, manage teams, influence individuals if the first two pillars aren't intact, right? We're not gonna be able to do that in the best way possible. And that's why specifically in America, 70% of professionals, they leave their job because of leadership, right? Because you have people that are working that fourth pillar, but they didn't do pillar one, two, and three. And so what does it do? Is it turns people away, it causes conflict, it causes tension, right? And we're never able to really coach at our best when we don't cultivate all four pillars. And so the pioneers of emotional and social intelligence, Peter Salavoy and John Mayer, they were very strategic in how they put these pillars. They put leadership last. What we tend to do, including myself, and I had to learn this as a coach, as a professor, as somebody that's been mentoring adults and kids around the world, I jumped to pillar number four when I was younger. I was like, great, I'm the leader, I'm gonna start leading, but I didn't really cultivate pillars one and two. And so I wasn't as effective as I could have been. And then I started to have some tension between people and I had to recognize that I needed to go all the way back and start with pillar one, okay? So I always say that self-realization is the key to sustainable success, okay? It's all about self-realization. That is really the key to su sustainable success, and that's what our goal is here. Our goal isn't to have success for short ter term, right? It's how do we have it for a long-term period and really make it sustainable. So again, we're gonna jump into some exercises here in, in, a, in a few minutes, but just a quick rundown again. These are our three, uh, three competencies under self-awareness, emotional awareness, accurate self-assessment, self-confidence, okay? Self-awareness, believing in your abilities, an awareness around how you show up, being able to identify and label your emotions, this second part, this next part is very, very crucial. Understanding your triggers, which we're gonna do some work on here in a minute, okay? So understanding why are you upset? Why do you feel frustrated? What about it? Was it the tone? Was it the phrasing that someone used? Was it their body posture and their mannerisms? Was it their face? Like what was you off? And that is really, really important when we're trying to manage our emotions is we have to get to the core of why am I bothered right now, okay? Identifying your strengths and weaknesses, trusting your intuition, locating where you feel your emotions, and pinpoint, pinpointing why you feel the way you feel. So let's jump into self-confidence for a little bit here because a lot of our triggers okay, that we have when we work with people or even within ourselves, they are a direct reflection of our self-confidence and our belief system, okay? And again, this also comes down to stress and stress management, is that when we feel stressed, typically it's because there's a feeling that you feel, and if you don't finish this project or if you don't manage this or if you don't get this done, there's a consequence. And so then we feel stressed right? And so really figuring out where those feelings come from can help us manage our stress. And let's bring this down to self-confidence. So as I mentioned, this is by far the greatest tragedy that I see amongst human beings globally, is that we have a lack of self-confidence, meaning that we don't feel like we're enough. 
And it affects how we show up in the workspace. It affects how we parent. It affects how we lead. It affects how we deal with our partner in a loving relationship. It all comes down to our belief system and whether it's positive or whether it's not so positive, okay? These are the things that affect your self-confidence, family life. And you guys all know this, right? Because we're in, we're in these industries where we're doing this actively every day, okay? Your family life, relationships, interactions with others, okay? Remember that when you're a baby, Okay, now I want you to think about yourself for a minute because I can almost guarantee if I did a coaching session with every single person, there's a bunch of beliefs that we could pull out that probably aren't serving you in the best way, right? Remember that when you're born, everybody's born with confidence. Everybody, okay? Every single person is born with confidence except for 7% of the population around the world. 7% of the population are born with a, you're all familiar with the oxytocin gene, right, in the brain. 7% are born with a particular oxytocin gene in a certain area of their brain, and they're born with a little bit more depression. But even then, they can still build positive beliefs. So it's only 7%. The other 93% are born with basically a clean slate. They're ready to learn. They're hungry. They're, just think about any babies or siblings that you ever had. They're unstoppable, right? They run all over the place. They jump off the wall. And it's not until they get older that someone says, you can't do that. Don't do this, right? No, 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 that's not good for you. And then over time, your childhood, relationships, teachers, friendships, they start to create these belief systems, right, that hinder us. Sometimes they help us and sometimes they hinder us, right? And everything that you are today, the way that you behave with other people, the way that you lead, the way that you coach, all stems from your experiences from this moment before, okay? And your clients and anybody that you're working with and any people that you're serving, same thing, okay? There's cultural that comes into play. There's, there's social and society you know, expectations that come into play, right? There's how an individual is grown up that comes into play. There's workplace environments that come into play that all affect our emotional and social intelligence, okay? Experiences that happen to you, either positive or negative. Your support system, both personally and professionally. Social engagement with peers in your age group, right? Any bullying, gossiping, right? And then again, social or cu cultural expectations. So I want you to ask yourself, okay, there's four categories that we call, what we call confidence crushers. They affect how we show up in the world, okay? Confidence crushers. There's four. The first one's family, okay? The second one is society, right? So social or cultural expectations, social media, that kind of thing. The third one is genetics. And then the fourth one is romantic relationships. So I just want you to assess yourself, which one do you think had the most effect on your confidence? Okay. Yep, exactly. So actually what we're seeing here is very common. So when we did our research, about 38% said family. The next largest category was society. Then actually to tell you the truth, the next one was genetics. They thought it was genetics, right? It wasn't proven, but they thought that maybe they were less confident because they were born that way. And then the last one was romantic relationships. So very, very interesting. And it, it seems that everything that we're putting here is pretty much right on par. We're seeing a lot of ones and twos. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Okay, so here's the great thing. Neuroscientists tell us that we have at least 70 thoughts a day. They're having some debate about it currently right now. Like, is it really 70,000 70, thoughts? Is it lower than that? Is it higher than that? But they're saying that we have about 70,000 thoughts a day and 80% of them are negative. <laughs> That's a big number, that 80% of our thoughts are negative. But here's the best part about it, is that they've also shown that we can actually rewrite our neural pathways, meaning that we can change our thought patterns. So if we have a negative thought, we can stretch our negative thought to be positive, but we just have to catch the thought right? So that, that's the important part. And that's where emotional and social intelligence comes in, is that many of us, we have thoughts that are subconscious that we don't even, we don't even know that we're having them. 
And especially if they're negative thoughts, well, how does that affect our energy on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So the more self-awareness that we can build in ourselves, the more we can catch the thoughts, rewrite the thoughts, and now break some of those beliefs that are getting in the way of how we work with other individuals, how we manage our stress, and how we show up on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So we're gonna do some exercises together, okay? Some practice time. So I always say that, it's okay to have negative thoughts, as we can see here. Nobody is gonna have a thousand percent or a hundred percent positive thoughts. Nobody that I ever know didn't have self-doubt. Every single human being, including Tony Robbins, Oprah, whoever you wanna to talk to, everyone has self-doubt. Everyone has some level of stress. It's how are we able to manage it and bring it down to a healthy zone, okay? so that we can show up and we can have well-being and positivity and not allow it to hinder our success. And that's really the point of this today. So we're gonna do these practices together and I'm gonna do them with you. So get comfortable, get some space. <laughs> okay, so the first one is diaphragmatic breathing. This is the, the easiest and probably um, one of my favorites because you can do it anywhere. Okay, so when you're feeling overwhelmed and when you're feeling stressed, it's doing diaphragmatic breathing that I'm gonna share, we're gonna do it here in a minute. I'm gonna show you how to do it. But the reality is that we're all on consumption overload, okay? The amount of information that we are bringing into our brain on a daily basis, not only information, but food, people's energy, right? The amount of stuff that's coming from a cell phone, from a TV, from the newspaper, from the laptop, from the emails, it's putting our brain on overload, okay? We're on stimuli overload. And that's why, and even for me, there's moments where I feel like I'm on edge all the time because there's just so much happening. You cannot, you can't manage it all, right? And so we have to be able to manage the consumption that's coming inward and we have to be able to stop it. So like, for example, I don't have cable anymore, TV. I don't, all I have is Netflix, okay? I watch that maybe once a week. I don't have news on my phone. I have one app, BBC. I open it once a day. That's it. Because I have to start canceling out consumption so that I'm not overwhelmed all the time by the amount of information that's being thrown at us from the outside world. Okay? Diaphragmatic breathing can really help ground you. And what that means is if anyone's a singer in the performing world, is that you're using the diaphragm right below the breastbone to breathe instead of your shoulder area, which is what we typically use. Okay, so everyone just sit up straight for me. Okay. Now you're gonna put your, you put your right hand like right below the breastbone on the top of the stomach area. Okay, so like if I were to stand up like right here. Okay, now you're gonna take a breath in and your stomach should go out as if you're creating the balloon. So it's actually the opposite of our day-to-day -day breathing. So when you take a breath in, the stomach goes out. So take a breath in. Hold it, and now your belly should be a balloon. If you did it the right way, your, your belly should be a balloon. Okay, now you're gonna release and your stomach's gonna go in and you're gonna push out. And now your stomach's gonna flatten. So again, when you take the breath in, stomach expands, and then when you release the air, the stomach comes all the way in, okay? So we're gonna do that again. We're gonna breathe in for three, we're gonna hold it for three, and then we're gonna release for three. Okay, here we go. Take a breath in. Hold, two, three, now release. Do that again. Hold, two, three, now release. Okay, so this is a real high, yeah, <laughs> I already feel bad. <laughs> so this is something that you can really use anywhere, right? Because even if you're, you know, you're walking in to see somebody or you're about to hop on the phone with, with a client or, or somebody that you're supporting, you could sit in your chair and you can do that, right? And you can just really get regrounded, especially when you feel like you've been in fight or flight mode all day. So that's the first strategy. So notice I'm gonna give you a couple strategies because everyone's a little bit different, 
right? So it's not one size fits all and it never is. So it wouldn't be fair for me to say diaphragmatic breathing, we're good. Now we can move on. Like, let me give you a couple and then you decide like, oh, I really like that one or this one's okay for me. So this is the point of that, okay? So the next one is meditation. And I know that we hear a lot about meditation and it doesn't have to be this like magnificent, you know, meditation that's for an hour where you're sitting in Zen. That's not always realistic. I'll be honest with you. I love meditation and I'm lucky if I can get five minutes in quiet. <laughs> After five minutes, my brain starts to talk and now I'm like planning the day. And so even if you can get five minutes, though, it can still help you. I use a really incredible app, and I'm sure there's a ton out there that you can use called Calm, C-A-L-M, okay? And you can get it for free. And they have guided meditation or meditation that's not guided. So I have days where I use guided meditation and someone's talking to me because my brain is going so fast that I can't manage it on my own in that moment, and that really helps. Or you can use another type that, yeah, thank you uh, for putting that in the chat or you can not use guided meditation and just be on your own. But it plays music, it has like different meditations that have to do with gratitude and self-love and time management and stress management and you can pick your mood. So meditation again is important because if we go back to that overload consumption that we were talking about, this just helps you get present in the moment. It helps you come back to earth, okay? The challenge that we're seeing today, again, with consumption overload and with our thoughts, the combination of the thoughts that we have and consumption overload, it puts us in either the past or the future, okay? And when you're in the past or the future, it's hard for you to be present to serve. It's hard for you to be present and to be grounded. We're in what we call non-realistic modes, meaning that the past is not real anymore because it's in the past, right? But we're still living there or the future hasn't happened yet, so it's an assumption or it's a stressor about the future that we don't even know is going to exist, right? And what we really wanna do is come back into the present moment and be grounded so that again, when we're speaking with individuals, right? When we're helping and serving others, we're in the present moment to show empathy, right? To help them manage themselves, for us to manage ourselves as well. So I recommend meditation, even if you can do two minutes, start with two minutes, then move to three the following week, then move to four, work your way up. I think sometimes it's a little intimidating because people say like meditate for an hour a day and you think I can't even turn my brain off for a minute. How am I going to do that? Right? So right, Alejandra, I say, <laughs> you're like nodding your head. <laughs> so two minutes is fine. Just put a little benchmark for yourself and say, okay, two minutes is good. And then go from there. Okay, the next one, and this is my favorite. So this is where we're gonna go into breakout modes, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing here. So all of you that have your video off, I hope that you're still engaged. The fourth one is just having conversations with yourself, right? Because when you're in moments that are stressful or when you're feeling like emotional or maybe what we call triggered, a lot of times it's our thoughts that are getting in the way, okay? And so some of you can really re resonate with this that your thoughts aren't always positive and they bring you down. Maybe they tell you that you're not good enough or you have a perfectionist mindset. And when you go to do something, it pulls you back and it tells you, no, don't do this, don't do that. And when you're able to have conversations with yourself, it takes the power away from the thought, okay? Remember this, your thoughts are not you, okay? Your thoughts are not you, they are separate from you and you are the person that's able to recognize the thought. So I have th conversations with my thoughts all the time. When I have a negative thought and I catch it, I talk to myself out loud. I say, thank you, Netta, but right now, I'm not gonna listen to that thought. I'm still gonna move forward. Or thank you, Netta, but right now, I'm not gonna let that thought hurt my feelings or I'm not gonna let that thought affect me right now. I'm moving forward. And when you're able to verbalize, right, the counteractive thought, that's more powerful than the silent thought in your mind. And so that's why I always say like, talk it out loud because the second you put it out, it's gonna be more powerful than the thought that you have mentally. And that's really, really important as we move forward. So being able to stop your thought, and I always say like, we always have 
self-doubt. There's always going to be fear. There's going to be these thoughts that get in the way of our success. And I always say like, you can let that get in the car, but don't let that little sucker grab the wheel. Like you hold on to the wheel and you keep the thought and the fear in the passenger seat and in the back seat. You take the wheel and you decide where you're driving. Okay. Don't let your thoughts hinder your success. And the more you're able to talk out loud, the more you diminish the power of it. The more you say, no, my voice is more important than the thought that I'm having mentally. Okay. And then the last part, which is one of the most difficult is what we call reverse engineering. So here's what I want everyone to do right now. I want you to write down one belief or one thought that you have that's getting in your way, like your own thought or belief that's getting in your way of your success in whatever area you want. It could be professional success. It could be personal success. It could be in your relationships. It can be as a parent, whatever you want. What's one thought or belief that you have that's getting in your way. Okay. Just write that down or text it or whatever works for you. And then on the opposite side, I want you to write down. I remember when, and I want you to try to pinpoint that thought. Where does it come from? What's the feeling that you have when you, when you feel it? When's the first time you felt it? And that's really what we want to try to identify as we're building self-awareness and managing our emotions and our stress is where is this coming from? Where is this thought or this feeling coming from? Is it from a last, is it from my last job that I had? You know, is it from a past coworker? Is it from a past relationship? Did somebody tell me this in the past? Where is it coming from? Because it's coming from somewhere. And when we can identify it, then we can start to break it down. When we can identify, it's too hard to break down and diminish. And the whole point is being able to diminish some of those thoughts that aren't serving you, that are creating more stress and more behavioral reactions in you when you are with other people. Okay, so just take couple of seconds to think about it. Some of you are going to find it right away. And some, for some people, it takes two, three weeks. I have clients that find it instantly. And then I have some clients that come back a month later and they're like, I figured it out. I identified it. And now you can take control and you can decide, is this thought serving me or is it hurting me? Is it causing more stress or is it helping me move forward? Okay, and this is a really, this is the more in-depth activity and that's why it's the last one, okay? Okay, so then again, we move on to pillar number two, which we've talked about, emotional self-control, transparency, resilience, achievement, motivation, optimism, all things that we've been discussing already. And again, the reason why we wanna do that reverse engineering technique is because we all have triggers and this is where stress comes in and this is where management comes in so there's something remember when we talked about the rubber band there's a, an experience or a person or something that triggers you okay and then we have an emotional reaction and then we behave we have a reaction then we have an emotional spiral then we create thoughts in our mind and then we have another behavioral reaction and the whole thing repeats all over again and so that's why when you do the reverse engineering and you build that self-awareness, you're able to stop the trigger before it gets to the behavioral action. You're able to stop and say, okay, I feel triggered. Your, your tone or the wording or the situation, it's not making me feel good. I need some time to process. I'll come back to it. And that's, that's the management that we want to build so that we can alleviate the stress and, again, the reactions that we have. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to take, like, a three-minute break before we move on because we have the other two pillars. But while we're taking this break, I just want you to screenshot this, okay? And I want you to do this a little bit later, later, like what behavior, like what's the behavior that triggers you? So I want you to think about maybe situations that you've been through where you've like got upset or frustrated or sad, or what's the behavior that triggered you? Where and what did you feel? And why does it trigger you? Like, where does it come from? So for example, I remember that when I was an executive leader, I, the behavior that triggered me is when team members would question me in the meeting. 
So as a leader, I really didn't like that when I was younger, okay, like 10 years ago. So that was the behavior that triggered me. And where and what did I feel? I automatically felt like my face turned red and I felt like this kind of like this furious feeling inside. And then why does it trigger you? That's the main question. Why did I feel so upset? And then I would, as a leader, I would basically just shut them down 10 years ago. And I would say, don't question me. I'm the leader. I'm going to tell you and you're going to do it. That's my, that was my thought 10 years ago. It's not like that anymore, right? Because I went through this process and I said, why does it trigger me? Well, when somebody asked a question in a meeting as a leader, I felt like they were negating me and they were trying to make me look bad. And then I felt like I wasn't good enough as a leader. And so then I had to work through all of those thoughts myself. And so now 10 years later, I run my own company and I have a team of 15 people. And when they ask me questions, I don't respond that way anymore. You see what I mean? But that was a trigger that I had to work through and break. So I want you to think about that. We have about two minutes to just to rest, stand up, stretch out, do whatever you need to do. And then we're going to keep moving on. So pillar number three, empathy, organizational awareness, and then being service oriented. So I'm going to jump into some strategies right away that we can all use because many of us here, we're leaders, we're coaches, we're mentors, right? We're providing service to other individuals. We're helping other individuals okay, navigate through some of their, their challenges and experiences in life. And so these are really, really important tools that we need. Okay. The first one when we're dealing with empathy and working with individuals is active, constructive responding. You may or may not have heard this before. This is called ACR, okay? This ensures that you hear what's being said from your team member or from your client or from you know, a coworker or a spouse or whatever it is, is we wanna make sure that we have three components, understanding, validation, and caring, okay? Typically what happens is that we have active destructive response. It's when we don't fully hear the individual, or maybe we have a passive reply, like, oh, okay, thank you so much, oh, good job, or yep, I hear you, and then we move on. Or we don't acknowledge them at all, or we tear them down, right? And what we really want is active, constructive response where we can say, I hear you, I understand you, let's talk about this. And the most important part to active, constructive response is questions okay, is asking questions to show engagement, okay? So not only saying, I hear you, I understand you, okay, um, I'm validating what they're saying, but now tell me more. Let's break this down a little bit more. Share with me a little bit more about your experience. Can you tell me a little bit more about what happened here? Obviously within perimeters and boundaries that we all have, right? But it's really the questioning that's gonna help you get to the core so that you can serve accordingly. So that's active constructive response. The second one is one of my favorite techniques and it's just, it's something to remember, okay? Don't should on people, S-H-O-U-L-D. Don't should on people, okay? Sometimes, especially when we're authorities and we're the coach or the mentor or the expert, okay? And I'm totally guilty of this and I had to break this is that we say you should, okay? Give me a thumbs up if you've done this before. And it's okay if you have, where you've told people you should do this, you should do that, right? And what happens is that when we do that, it actually creates a defensive mode for individuals because nobody wants to be told what to do, okay? So try using delivery methods such as, what do you think of? You may want to try. Have you tried? I've seen great success in. So, and it's okay to write some of these phrases down and have like a little pocketbook. Do you know what I mean? That you can use when you're working with individuals. But even myself, sometimes when I work with clients, I say, you, you know, don't, you shouldn't do that. Or, you know, you should really do this. And I have to catch myself. And I say, never mind, you don't need to do anything I recommend. Or you may want to try, or how do you feel about this? And really just changing the vocabulary, okay? The next strategy is my favorite. It's called AIO. Acknowledge, isolate, overcome. Acknowledge, isolate, overcome. 
So we always want to acknowledge what the person is saying first. Now, again, this is really hard when you're involved, okay? So again, it's a little bit more easy when you're working with your clients, right? Because you're not always involved in maybe their challenges, but you're there to support them. But how does this look when you're at home with your kids or when you're at home with your spouse and they're coming to you about you? <laughs> Usually we skip the acknowledge and the ice. We, we skip all three of them, right? And then we get into the defensive mode of, well, I, that's you. I didn't do that. This, and then we just, that's kind of the chatter is what happens back and forth, right? So what we really want to do again is be able to manage our emotions so that we can acknowledge. I hear what you're saying. Okay. You might not like it, but you acknowledge, I hear what you're saying. You're hearing, I'm hearing you say that I hurt your feelings. Okay. So I acknowledge, thank you for sharing with me. Now we're isolating. So if I hear you correctly, you're upset because I said A, B, C, and D in front of my brother. Is that accurate? Is that right? No, that's not what I mean at all. Okay, great. Let's try to isolate. So now you know the isolate part is important because people speak different languages, right? And I don't mean different native languages. I mean communicative languages. So for example, the word respect might mean something completely different to somebody else. And so that's why being able to isolate, it clarifies that your understanding of what they just said is also their same understanding. Okay, so then when you isolate and you say, so what I hear you, you saying is that you're upset about what I said in front of my brothers. No, nope, that's not what I said at all. Okay, great. Let's try this again. Tell me a little bit more. Okay, so what I hear you saying is that you felt that I embarrassed you. Yes. Okay, so now we have acknowledge and now we have isolate. Once you're able to isolate, now we can overcome. Okay, okay so you felt embarrassed because of what I said in front of my brothers. So let's try to overcome this, okay? What would you have preferred, I say? Or what could I have done better next time? And now we can find solutions. Same thing with your clients. You acknowledge what they're saying, you isolate what they're saying so that you're really clear on what it is that they're saying, and now you help them overcome. And these three steps are very important. This is my favorite strategy that I use. I use this every single day, okay? The last one, this is very elementary and most of us know this, but it's hard to remember. That's the difference between hard skills and soft skills. So what we're doing right now is called the soft skill, right? And it's, it's basically your people, your emotional and your communication skills. They're really easy to understand. So we know we should manage our stress. We should be a good human being. We should be a great leader. We should be inclusive. We, should, we know all those things but it's a lot more difficult to implement in our day-to-day -day life, right? Where the hard skills, sometimes they're really difficult to understand, but when we get it, we get it. We understand that two plus two equals four. It might take us a while to understand that, but once we get the equation, we never forget it. Soft skills are the opposite. And that's why we have to constantly cultivate and nurture the skill. Sometimes it takes 60, 90, 120 days to build self-awareness and to manage. So you versus I is a very simple thought that we understand. It's a very simple strategy that we don't want to use you, but it's a lot more difficult to practice in the moment. So for example, instead of saying, you never listen when I give you direction, try saying, I feel that when I give direction, it's not being heard or applied. Big difference, right? big difference in how we say it and also a big difference in how someone is going to receive the information. Okay. And then the last strategy, and again, remember that you can choose which ones work for you. The last strategy is something called PCP. Okay. And you might have used this and you might not. And it's positive, constructive, positive. I think I took the slide out, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. Positive, constructive, positive is that when you need to give constructive feedback to somebody, you put it in the middle of a positive sandwich, okay? Now, some of you have had this before and some of you like it and some of you don't, and that's okay, but everyone's different. So I have team members that love positive, constructive, positive. So when I need to give them some feedback because something's not working, I'll give them a positive first. You're doing really, really great with your email etiquette. I know a couple months ago that was a challenge for you, but it's, I've really seen an improvement. 
I just want to remind you that when you are writing your emails, we want to make sure that we're addressing da 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 da, and then don't forget to put a greeting at the end. Now we end with another positive. But again, the improvements that you've had with your writing in the past three months are amazing. So just keep doing what you're doing. Let me know if you need any more support. Do you see what I did there? Positive, constructive in the middle, positive. The main thing about these strategies that I'm giving you, and this is where the mentor and the coach and the leader in you comes in, is you have to be able to identify which ones to use with which clients, right? Because some of your clients are going to love the AIO. Some of your clients are going to love the PCP. For me, I don't like PCP, right? I need just like, tell me what you need and make it happen. Like, I don't want any sugar coating. I just need, I just tell me the, the constructive feedback. But I know that if I do that to a team member of mine, they're not going to receive it well. So you have to be able to know which method am I going to pull out for which person, okay? Pillar number four, relationship management. All things leadership, coaching, mentorship, one of my favorite pillars. The ability to influence, coach, manage conflict, be an inspirational leader, create teamwork, and be relatable, okay? So here's a couple things to being a leader and with this fourth pillar. The first one is be accountable to action for change, okay? Now that we're building self-awareness and we're building self-management and we're building social awareness, what are you gonna do with all those tools, right? When something is happening to a client or in the workspace or at home, are you gonna take initiative, a positive initiative to create change or are we gonna be bystanders, okay? So this is a very important concept because a lot of times what happens, and these are the things that we also need to be encouraging to our clients and the individuals that we're serving is to be empowered to take positive action for change because that's the only way we'll be able to okay i think now that cut off just uh one minute i'll reach out to him we need those individuals and I know that a lot of you are cultivating this amazing work but we need to help individuals that don't feel empowered to speak up or that don't know how to lead or don't know how to step forward and we help them and we bring them along okay and then the last part of emotional intelligence is transformational leadership so transformational leaders they inspire growth and they motivate Again, they inspire growth and they motivate. And this is my favorite type of leadership. There's positive leadership, inspirational leadership, but transformational leadership is really what we want, okay? I'm gonna encourage you to really tap into transformational leadership because remember that the only way we can create sustainable change is through deep-rooted transformation, okay? If we don't have transformation, then the change is too surfacey, meaning that in 30 days or in 60 days, it goes back to the way that it was. And that's why transformational leadership is so key here, okay? So transformation part one, how do we create transformation? We engage in meaningful conversations. We ask the right questions. So remember when we went back to active constructive response, it was about questioning. Transformation could only occur when you have the right information and the only way you can get the right information is by asking meaningful questions tell me where you want to be in one year tell me where you see yourself tell me what some of the challenges are that we need to move through now when you have more data or more information you can intelligently take the next step remember that every single person is different there's no cookie cutter way of doing things and that's why when you ask questions, it gives you a lot of information so that you can understand what's the next best step, okay? The next part is getting to the core, okay? So it's not about what the individual is doing or how they're doing it. So it's not what the behavior is, it's not how the behavior is happening, it's why. 
why is the behavior there and where did it come from? That's the question. And that's what we have to get. Now, remember, you can use this with every single person in your life, with your clients, with the individuals that you serve, with your kids, with your spouse. It's not what your kid is doing. It's not how they're doing it. It's why they're doing it. Why is that behavior happening and where did that behavior come from? And when you get to the core, now we can move into the proper step. And the last step is being the potential seeker, okay? Uncovering blind spots, not only in yourself, but uncovering blind spots in the individuals that you work with and serve. Remember, people don't know the blind spots that they have. That's why they're blind spots. They don't know they exist. And they need incredible people like you to come in and say, I know there's more in there. I know there's more to you than what you think there is. There's so much more greatness in there than you realize. And sometimes it takes somebody like you coming from the outside in for that individual to create change in themselves. Think about a moment in your life where you really created change. It was probably because somebody came up to you, whether it was a coworker, a spouse, a parent, and said, and said, Alejandra, I know there's more in there. I know there's more in there. You might not be able to see it, but I can see it. And then that created a little spark in me that said, maybe there is, right? And then it created some empowerment that said, okay, let me explore that a little bit. You have the power to do that with every single person you come in contact with. And that, my friends, is transformational leadership, okay? It's not limited to any title or anything. Any person that you have come in contact with, you have that ability. My goal right now is that I'm creating transformational leadership in you so that you can pay it forward. And that is the circle of humanity that happens over and over and over again that we really want to cultivate. So transformational leadership is at its fullest potential when the transformed has now the ability to transform others. So when you have been transformed so much from another leader that you're now able to take it and pay it forward to the next person. And that is true transformational leadership. Okay, so let's talk about your plan here. Let's do this together. I want you to write this down. Where are you now? What's the great right now that's happening for you? And what's the challenge? Just jot that down really quick. Where are you now? The great and the challenges. Okay. Now, what's one action step you can take in the next 14 days? One action step. And the reason why I say one is because, again, we don't need to overwhelm ourselves. We don't need to have this huge master plan. Sometimes it's just one step, one little action step that can help you step forward. So you might say, you know what? I really liked this emotional intelligence. I want to explore more of this. So my one action step is I'm going to get a book on emotional intelligence and I'm going to read deeper. My one action step is that I'm going to explore self-confidence because I realize that maybe, maybe I have too little of self-confidence and I got to work that out in myself so I can better serve people, right? Maybe it's, I'm going to explore a little bit more on transformational leadership, whatever it is, just one small step. Okay. I always say the hardest part about change is recognizing that you need it. But remember, and I say this over and over and over again, the greatest tragedy today is wasted human potential. And we don't want that to be your story. And we don't want that to be anybody's story. Right? And the more we cultivate this emotional and social intelligence, the closer we are to bridging that potential gap within ourselves. So I'm going to leave you with some homework. <laughs> okay. So I want you to rate yourself. Okay. We're going to spend like the next two minutes. I want you to rate yourself one through 10 on each one of these EQ competencies. Okay. 10 being amazing. 
Like 10 is like, I am so amazing at this. Not a problem. One being danger zone and then everything in between. Okay. You're going to label each box. So self-talk one through 10. What is your self-talk positive or is it not? Is it unkind? One through 10. What is it? Labeling emotions, accurate self-assessment, expressing yourself, confidence, realizing your triggers. So go all the way through and put yourself one through 10 in each one of those. Okay. And you could just like write it down and then I'll send this again to Tadek, but take a 30 seconds now and then I'll show you the next part of it. Okay, now on the next page, same thing, one through 10. Now these are the bottom two pillars, working with others. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to send that to Tadek. You rated yourself. If you missed it, you can catch up and rate yourself, okay? But then you're going to take that assessment and you're going to send it to five other people. And they're going to do it on you. They're going to assess you. And this goes back to the accurate self-assessment and finding our blind spots, okay? Because if we only rated ourselves, well, there's a lot of bias there, right? Because we all have blind spots. But what we really want to do is send this to five or more people and see how accurate we are. If you gave yourself a nine in leadership and then six people send back and give you a four, what does that tell us? Then we might have a blind spot when it comes to leadership, right? If you give yourself a four in confidence, and six people come back and give you a nine in confidence, what does that tell us? You're too hard on yourself, right? So this is really what we wanna see to be able to break some of those blind spots and help us build that emotional and social intelligence, okay? So I'm gonna pass this over to Tadek. We have some time for Q&A, and then Tadek, I know that you're gonna um, do some other things, but. I know that was a lot of information, but hopefully very useful for you that you can start applying and using. Um, and definitely the resources that I sent to Tadek will help as well. But I, I think that again, this could really be a game changer for everyone because EQ is by far, it's by far my favorite competency. Whenever a company comes to me and says, we need diversity and inclusion, we need leadership, we need communication, I say, we start with EQ.